The scripture lesson today is from Psalms chapter 50, verses 7 through 15. The message by Eugene Peterson. Are you listening, dear people? I'm getting ready to speak, Israel. I'm about to bring you to trial. This is God, your God, speaking to you. I don't find fault with your acts of worship, the frequent burnt sacrifices you offer. But why should I want your blue ribbon bull or more and more goats from your herds? Every creature in the forest is mine, the wild animals on all the mountains. I know every mountain bird by name. The scampering field mice are my friends. If I get hungry, do you think I'd tell you? All creation and its bounty are mine. Do you think I feast on venison or drink draughts of goat's blood? Spread for me a banquet of praise. Serve high God a feast of kept promises and call for help when you're in trouble. I'll help you and you'll honor me. So ends the reading. This is the living word of God. So, dear friends, this is our last worship and sermon about birds. And I thought we'll have a mythical bird. And of course, it is hidden in this reading, and we will eventually get there. But uh, you are good sports. You survived something like nine sermons about birds. So, toucan is not a big problem for us here, really. Uh, There are more kind of bizarre birds than that, but uh, like hornbeaks, which are really ugly, or kakaburas uh, in, <laughs> in Australia, uh, who are really laughing lovingly. Uh, but returning to this psalm and its charge, it is almost like a judicial proceeding where God is calling people and saying, I am not interested in your offerings. If I was hungry, do you think I will ask you? There were clearly, there was clearly a time when people thought that through the sacrifices they were feeding God. And indeed, some of the oldest stories about the origins of humankind, of, you know, what is the origin and what is the purpose of human beings, there that the people were created to cultivate the land and feed their gods. Of course, they were pagans and they were polytheists by bringing them sacrifices. There are even stories, very funny, you know, like the junior gods were kind of not uh, that eager to care for those uh, higher up gods in Mesopotamia. And that was the reason why humankind was created. And interestingly, echoes of that can be found in the Bible, in the story of the Garden of Eden. You know, humankind was created to tilt and care for that garden. And we should take it into our heart in an environmental, ecological way, of course. We can expand it. But that is one of the echoes why humankind was created. And the other instance is, for instance, after flood, Noah's first action is to offer a sacrifice. And that is, uh, again, mirrored in Babylonia, where those hungry gods kind of are gathering. <laughs> on that first sacrifice. There were times in the history of our religion that people perceived temple sacrifices as feeding God. And this might look quite primitive or foolish, especially considering what we heard in the children's message. (laughs) Uh, But it was not naive or ridiculous, friends. Originally, originally, there was a deep theological thinking behind it. 
thinking in a different way than we think in philosophical terms and so on, but there was a religious holidays. On those holidays, people gathered to worship God, and shepherds brought their best animals, and farmers brought their first fruits of their fields and orchards and vineyards, and together they had this big celebration, thank you, thanking God for that feast. Big expenses were covered by the rich, especially by the royals back then. And there were religious rituals, of course, and there were songs, and there were liturgies, and there were sacrifices. And assigned parts of the sacrifices were burned on altars to feed God. But God was not the only one who was feasting. Of course not. On holidays and festivals, they were almost like something like big cookouts or great picnics, like a barbecue for the entire community. Was it French anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss who reminded us how food and drink are efficient vehicles of culture and religious experience? Meals, and especially special meals, are indeed perfect makers and conveyors of religious, cultural, and social significance and meaning. In sacrifice, God was fed and positively inclined towards the worshipers. And at the same time, every single member of that community, every single member of that society also had their full. God ate and people ate. Rich and poor, and rich very often were those who provided the stuff for everyone else. And it had social dimension, and it had spiritual or religious dimension. Just think about it. It is a special event when we invite our friends, and we can host them, and we share the table. That's that commensality, sharing the table, sharing the food. We are expressing to one another a large amount of trust and we are eating together. And here it is expanded heavenwards. God is at the table with us. That is the symbolism and that is the meaning of the Lord's table also. God is with us, eating, communing with us. But there is also further that social and cultural dimension and that is where people just took it easy and wrong way. Human selfishness and magical thinking, magic thinking of selfishness, you can call it, or uh, magic selfishness sneaked in here. And those rich sponsors of those sacrifices, of those feasts and holidays, they thought magically that they could gain and carry extra favors with God if they limit those others from that circle of feasting and eating. And they thought that they'll carry extra favor with God if those sacrifices are offered just to God and that they'll offer more of them, forgetting about those other around them who were supposed to feast and eat with them as I described the origins of sacrifices. They thought that they'll provide more and more and more expensive for God, forgetting about the poor. 
and there were ever more liturgies and splendid rituals and rich sacrifices and less and less of those communal celebrations, those community-wide picnics and barbecues. And here is where our psalm, Psalm 50, comes in. It is a prophetic protest against this perversion of sacrifices and of religion. Psalmist reminds us that God does not really need to depend on human sacrifices. Everything, everything belongs to God. Absolutely everything. Even the most elusive creatures, which are birds in the mountains. Those were for the people in Palestine, quite distant. <laughs> And they realized that those birds in the mountains, many of them hardly ever seen any kind of those birds, like in Lebanon, you know, that the, the, they could see the mountains somewhere above the horizon. And then the most translations continue animals of the field. First of all, that is probably not directly field. It is like that uh, savanna around but that's, or wilderness, we can almost call it. But in fact, this was originally a reference to a wild, mythic bird. Rabbis are quite positive about it, because that bird has a name, and it is right here, and instead of animals, or those kind of creatures of the field, it is Ziz. It's the name of that bird, Ziz. It's a mythical bird, a flying monster kind of like, uh, how, how are those uh, griffins, like mixture of a big bird and some other wild animal. And everyone was scared of those things. And here we are told, God keeps this feared, dreaded monster as a pet bird, almost like at home, because it said, all around me. I have these all around me. So elusive birds, frightening monsters, all belong to God. Don't even think that you can feed God. Anything God does, not, there is always that God has everything. I got a little here <laughs> lost in my thought. Anything God can have. You cannot gain any favor by magical religious rituals. God does not need to be fed. God wants that we feed hungry together with God. This is the best feast we can brought to our God. Feasting with God means that we feast with one another and with those around us who need it most. And that is not just psalm. This is in a very good biblical prophetic tradition. Take, for instance, Isaiah, and that opens, that's chapter one of Isaiah. You know, it's otherwise quite long, 66 chapters. But here you are, first chapter. What makes you think I want your sacrifices? says the Lord. I am sick of your burnt offerings. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. The incense of your offerings disgusts me. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not look. Offer many prayers, I will not listen for your hands are covered with the blood of the innocent. Wash yourself and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the right of the widows. 
and here orphans and widows, and you heard that, and the congregation knows that already quite well. That's an, like a signal word or signal phrase for all those, we would call them refugees, homeless, and, and so on and so forth. Back then, it was gathered under these two words. And that is not only Isaiah. It goes further. It goes further. Amos. Oh, Amos. He is a prophet and quite outspoken. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I won't even notice all your choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Instead, what I want to see, a mighty flood of justice and an endless river of righteous living. That is, dear friends, the context of the quotation made famous by Martin Luther King. Justice rolling down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. It's different translation, but the same text. It is a protest against empty, magical, selfish religiosity concentrated only on me or only on us. Again, perverted, self-serving religion. True sacrifices are not really feeding God like we talked about it, unless, unless the entire community is being fed, and especially those who could not afford it. Even a sacrifice of dove might be above their means, but they should be included. Those are those sacrifices of thanksgiving when all eat together and eat together with God. In Holy Communion, we are eating with our resurrected Lord. But it is also a commitment, the task to act in the way Jesus did, eating with the outcasts and feeding the hungry. When we celebrate Holy Communion, we accept this challenge and take seriously that charge to feed the hungry. And when we include the true Christian mysticism from Matthew 25, and Presbyterian Church is now uh, in that kind of movement of being a church of Matthew 25. If we feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, dress the naked, welcome the stranger, care for prisoners, then we are indeed feeding and truly eating and caring for our Lord. Lord is present, alive today in those people who need our help. And a world communion reminds us that this charge, this challenge is global. Concern about the entire world, not only our neighborhood. Yes, our neighborhood first, but the entire world, just like our psalmist reminds us. There is nothing wrong about our human desire to feed the Lord have God as our table companion. It's all right. God wants to be our common sal, the one sharing with us the table. Yeah. Jesus gave us communion, told us to do it in remembrance and with that commitment someone with whom we share the table. But it happens when we open that very table to those ostracized, those left out, those who are hungry. 
There is indeed something special. Community building, deep transformative, spiritual reorienting happening when we share the table with the global neighbors and thus with God. Such eating, dear friends, and such drinking, indeed, builds up community and shows our cultural values, our religious values, to one another and everyone around us that is that true witness of the church.